with five seconds. He's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown, Carolina. Back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And it's Warner <laughs> with yes, a sir. 54 yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it. Here's Kupak. Gives off to Amos. He's good. 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 Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio, he's going to take it for a touchdown. Are you kidding me? This is the Heel Tough Blog Podcast on Spreaker.com. Hey, guys, and welcome into a very special edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. First, we want to thank you guys for listening and tell you to subscribe and review the podcast on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to our podcast. We're so glad that you're along with us. Most of you guys have been along with us for a while now, and you would know that today is the 100th episode of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. We've been doing this since last February, and believe it or not, it has grown into... Just a fantastic show. I know you guys, a lot of you guys have been along with us for the long run. If you haven't been along with us for the entire time, we do encourage you to, of course, go back and listen to some of the older episodes. We have some fantastic episodes that we did early on in the show's series where we talked to some of the former players, such as Bren Renner, Travis Bond, who's playing up in the CFL. So many great guys that we had on uh Towards the start, I think it was like last March or April, we had a lot of those guys on, so some great stuff there that we encourage you guys to go back and listen on. Of course, the podcast started with one uh, episode back on February 5th of 2018, which was me just giving you guys a quick little update, as I said at the start, prior to National Signing Day for the 2018 class. I have come a long way since then. So have my co-hosts, both Josh Marlowe and Zach Hubbard, who have been along the way. Of course, Zach was the guy that started it out. Josh took over for him, and then Zach came back with us. And so um, we're glad to have both of those guys now on board. want to thank them, all of the former players who have come on the show, as well as the current journalists. They've done such a great job of giving us some great information, whether it's been the Toriel journalists, such as Pat James, Jonathan Alexander, Sam Doughton. We've had so many great guys on, or the national guys, such as Athlon Sports' Stephen Lassen, Phil Steele, who writes the College Football Bible, and even Brett Ciancia of Pick 6 Previews. We've had so many great guys on that we cannot thank you guys enough. Um, Jones Angel, another one that comes to mind who's been on with us. So we want to thank all of those guys who have been with us, everybody that's been a part of the Heel Tough blog podcast to this point, and hope you will celebrate the 100th edition of the podcast with us. So we have a very special edition of the podcast with it being the 100th edition. We are going to do a little bit of a debate topic. So I know that this is normally some of the off-season stuff that we hear. But we figured we'd save this one for the 100th edition of the show, where we will tell you who we think the greatest Tar Heel ever when it comes to the gridiron is. So we have some guys that are up for debate. We were doing this in the pre-show meeting. Josh Marlowe, of course, is with us here. Um, he is our uh, main ho- main co-host. He's here for a lot of our. Uh, he's been here for a lot of our off-season stuff. He's going to be our in-season guy as well. Of course, you guys know that uh, Zach Hubbard is back with us for recruiting. But um, you know, with this topic, we were discussing just so many different guys before the show started. Kind of a yay or nay as to whether or not they would be in consideration. There are a lot of great names that were left off, but I guess you know w- w- we want to start by mentioning the list that we are considering. So, um, really, the criteria is mainly what you did at Carolina. We will take your pro career into you know into consideration a little bit. 
Not too much. We don't want that to be the ultimate determining factor. But clearly, if you did something spectacular at the pro level, you're a really good football player. And most of our guys that had major impacts at the pro level also had major impacts at the college level. So the list that we are considering, of course, Lawrence Taylor, who, of course, everybody knows as one of the greatest, not only in Carolina history, but in NFL history amongst pass rushers, had a phenomenal career with the New York Giants where he won two Super Bowls. And so he is one of the first guys that came to mind when we thought about this list. Julius Peppers, defensive end from uh, the Carl Torbush era that eventually carried over into John Bunning's first season. He is also in consideration, a guy that was just a complete and utter um, disaster for offensive lines in the ACC in the late 90s and in the early 2000s. He tore it up for so many years, came right out of the gate as a freshman and did it. So he is in consideration. Charlie Choo Choo Justice, the running back from, of course, the 1949 team um, that everybody most famously remembers under head coach Carl Snaverly. Um, you know, th- this is another one that, you know, you-, you look at his overall body of work, and this was just an absolutely fantastic player. A guy that really did everything for Carolina at the time was a quarterback, also a halfback. So uh, Charlie is definitely in consideration. We talked about. Uh, Dre Bly, how could you not put Dre Bly up there? Another guy came right on the scene early on in his career, 11 interceptions in his first season, and you know just continued it from there. 20 career interceptions, a guy that was voted to an All-American team three times, including being voted at least by one publication to the first team in each of those three years. So Dre Bly's in consideration. One that we had a little bit of a debate about these last two we really did. So I guess, you know, I'll start with Art Wiener, the defensive. Well, he's listed as an end from the 19, the late 90s. Um, another guy that was a teammate of Charlie Justice's uh, on a fantastic team that was, you know, in consi- I mean, for, for a while, there, there were a lot of times where that team was in the running to be nationally recognized. Of course, earlier you know, in, in the college football history, there weren't as many bowl games, so it wasn't as easy to make bowl games. But um, Art Wiener was a guy that was way ahead of his time at Carolina. Um, his Some of his records actually stood well into the 1990s. Um, and for tight ends, which is probably what you would list him at, there's a little bit of a debate of whether you'd list him at wide receiver or tight end. Most of his records stood until Eric Ebron came on campus. And then the last guy that we put in consideration is defensive lineman William Fuller. This one was a little bit tough. This was probably the toughest decision for us. A two-time All-American, three-time All-ACC player. But really, I mean, he's got a a guy that has 57 total uh, career tackles for loss and really is just a phenomenal player. We went back and forth on him a little bit as to whether we would consider him here, but I think there's just too much there to leave him off the list. So those are the six guys that we are considering. Um, Is there anybody else that you really wanted to mention? I know that you had talked a little bit about Don McCauley. Um, I think running back, can we agree running back was probably the toughest? That's that's the area we had to leave off the most guys that were probably qualified to be on this list. Yeah, that's definitely the position that Carolina has a lineage of producing great players at. Um, so we talked about McCauley, uh, Amos. Mm-hmm. Um, hell, we even started talking about Natron Means at, at one point. So Mike Voigt was definitely yeah. in there. Leon Johnson was an extremely tough one to leave off the list. Uh, so yeah, it, it very, was, it was very, definitely the, the 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 hardest to start chopping people off the consideration list. Right. Um, Defensive line, I think, had some some guys in there as well that we had to talk about a little bit. But I think I, I think the top two guys are just separated enough from the other guys that it's like okay, the, these are the guys that we have to go with. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I mean, those, those were the six. Um, so I, I, I guess, I mean, is there one that we, we can definitely say in that group that you would not have, and maybe we just discuss it a little, him, him a little more in depth. I probably wouldn't have went with Fuller. It's just kind of, okay. you know, and then like you said, he accomplished a lot, great player, but you've also, I mean, you're, we're stacking him up against. LT's also on this same list. Right. So, like, that's why you'd probably cross him off first because you, you know he's not going to go over LT or Julius Peppers. I would, yeah, I would not have him over there. The only argument that I 
guess you could make is that LT, a lot of his production came in the last two seasons of his career, mainly in the final year. Fuller was a little more consistent early on, but I, I think you're right. I think it's 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 really tough to stack him up with the likes of Julius Peppers and LT. Fantastic player. Um, you know, a guy that I think not a lot of Tar, Tar Heel fans talk about when you talk about the all-time greats in program history, and I, that's why I, I, I kind of pounded the table for him to at least be on the list of guys that we discuss, because... I mean, with, without him in the middle of those 1980s defenses, I understand that you still had LT, but, even, but after LT left, you know, th- those defensive lines were still really, really good. And, you know, William Fuller was one of the main reasons why they were that good. So I, I felt it was important to talk about him. Um, so we, we talked, okay, so may, we, we mainly talked about three guys, which was Julius Peppers, Lawrence Taylor, and Charlie Justice. I said that I think Dre Bly has a very interesting case. Now, I'm not saying that this is my guy. We're going we're, we're gonna, to, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about all these guys just a little bit more in depth. And then we will give you our picks for who the greatest player in Toro football history is all time. I know with Dre, one of the biggest knocks for you was mainly his NFL career as it stacks up against the other guys on this list. Um, you know, I, I, I think that Dre was kind of overshadowed by some of the other really great corners that you had in the NFL at the time. Um, you know, we, we had this discussion on, we, we, do a, we do a radio show for the broadcasting school that we attended and we talked about this with Ty Law, who just went into the Hall of Fame. Now, I'm not saying that Dre Bly is on the same level, but Ty Law was a guy that we said, okay, was overshadowed in the NFL with how much talent there was in secondaries at the time. I mean, Dre Bly's numbers are not phenomenal, but it never really seemed like he was the number one guy at, may, at any of the stops, maybe outside of Detroit, where I'm pretty... I mean, he was seen as the number one corner, in my opinion. But... I mean, when you talk about the, what what was the reasoning that you didn't have Dre on that list? Well, part of it, and this is going to sound kind of odd because you look at his production, right. is phenomenal. But how many times do you say a cornerback wins you a football game? Well, I'm going to tell you, in his freshman year, you can make an argument that and, and he, he was winning football games. And with, you 11 could with 11 interceptions. Yes, definitely. But, when you look at the football game as a whole, you never think, well, because they have a great corner, they beat us today. Now, does it help? Yeah. Definitely. Like that, we saw it when Seattle had the Legion of Boom that because they had such a great secondary, it was tough to beat them, but they also had a really, really good front seven. That's a good point. So I think that was probably the reason why, is like whenever I just think about why Carolina was was so good – when he was there was, yeah, because of him, but also because they were good at other spots. And Okay. So that's, so this is interesting because there was actually an article that came out today from Sporting News by our friend of the podcast, Bill Bender, um, who does a phenomenal job over there. He was talking about how Mac Brown is looking as if he's going to be recruiting at about the same level as he was in the 90s. Now, it's early, but the signs are pointing to the fact that he could get back to that level, mainly because of the staff that he has around him. Dre Bly was one of the guys that was mentioned in the article and was focused on a lot. But my biggest takeaway in terms of this argument is that that defense had all but one guy that started on that defense. So that's 10 defensive players that went on to the NFL and played at least two years. So it's it's interesting because I get what you're saying. There was so much talent around him that maybe when it comes to just how great he was, maybe the guys around him affected it a little bit, took away from it a little bit. I understand that. Now, here's the argument for Dre Bly. 
Uh, first of all, 11 interceptions in a season is ridiculous. Now, you don't see that in today's football. Very, very, very rare. It's ex- an extremely tough feat to achieve, even in the NFL. Yeah. Um, so it's phenomenal. 20 career interceptions still stands as the program record at Carolina. Now, I'm going to tell you, in recent years, there has been nobody that's come close because the Tar Heels have really struggled turning the football over. That may be a record that never gets broken. It could. I, I, I would agree. I think uh, when you talk about unbreakable records in Tar Heel football history, that one and probably Amos Lawrence's 1,000 yards rushing in four consecutive seasons – I don't, I don't know if that'll ever be broken unless the nature of the game goes back to run heavy, which it could. It could. But we've been saying that for a while, that football is a cyclical game. Well, we've been in this passing cycle for a while now. So I, I don't know if, if it'll ever get back to there. But I agree. I think that's one of the ones that will never get broken. Probably his 11 interceptions in a season will never get broken. The clo- yeah. you got to think, the closest anybody's come to it since then is Tremaine Goddard, who did it his freshman year in 07. So, which is pretty interesting that both of these guys, both him and Tremaine, um, both did it their freshman years. Well, and you got to think, you're, you're, <laughs> you know, you're newcomers to the league. Right. There's no film on you as a tendency as a cornerback. Right, exactly. So, it, 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 it's surprising, but also it does make sense because they, right. they don't know what to expect from you. And, I mean, you look at, with, with Dre, three-time All-American, only Tar Heel to ever do that. And like I had mentioned earlier, there are all different publications for who votes on All-Americans. And as you get later on in history, there are more and more publications that vote and put together their own groups of All-Americans. Dre was listed as a first-team All-American by at least one media source in each of those three years. So... I mean, nobody's come really close to that in Carolina history. There's been there, there's been all Americans, but to be on the first team three straight years is crazy. Um, you know, a guy that won Rookie of the Year in the ACC in 1996, um, and was I, I, he was a freshman that year or an All American that year as a freshman. Only one other Tar Heel in school history has accomplished that, and that was Ryan Switzer. When, and and he landed on there mainly because of his punt returning. So it was more of a special team. So I think you, you would give the edge there to Dre because you know getting defensive recognition is a lot tougher than getting special teams recognition. Still an amazing feat by Ryan Switzer. But I, I think that Dre gets an edge there. That's why Ryan isn't on this list, which is extremely tough because if anybody knows me, I am... One of I, I was Ryan, probably one of Ryan Switzer's biggest supporters when he was at Carolina. So um, I think I, I think Dre is worthy of being in the conversation. I at least for me. No, at least I mean, for me. There's a there's for the a greatest discussion for right. him to be had. Okay, it's just when you look at see what the, I'm saying is I think there's I think there's four that that can be hotly debated. If, you think it's three I with Dre three, on the outside, but, which but, is okay. If, okay. If, if we're going to make it four, gotcha. then he's four. I agree. I agree. I don't think there's anybody else that you can put up there. I'm, you know, I would just, you know, let's play hypothetical here. Let's say you put him on a defense, but that doesn't have ten other players or nine people that went in the NFL. So put him on this year's defense. Or let's just say 2012, 2013, whatever. Okay. When the defenses in Chapel Hill weren't, Good. Well, they were. St- I mean, those the 2012. Because you're still talking about Copels and some of the guys well, okay, that, that Larry, the holdovers Larry, Larry from Fedora Bush. Was here. The defense was never good. <laughs> Vic, is, Vic is, Coning is your D coordinator. Is, you know, let's just put that on. Paper. Is he being as productive? And and, and so hypothetically, <sighs> you're going to say no because he doesn't have nine other NFL caliber players playing with him. Because I don't think he would have been thrown at as much. Which okay is a good argument for why you would say Dre might not be here because Robert Williams, who was opposite of him at corner while he was at Carolina, was another very, very good player. Another guy that's just not talked about a whole lot. Right. I put him on my defensive back list, and I'm definitely sticking by him. Even though the statistics aren't there, Robert Williams was a fantastic player. So, so I, I just, okay. 
as we move to uh, these other three guys, gotcha. They directly impact the game, okay, because they're a part of seemingly every play. I agree. Okay, okay. So our okay. So can we talk about Art Wiener just really quickly? A two way end, a guy that had near. He was close to two thousand yards receiving. It was it's seventeen hundred, so still three hundred yards away. But really, I mean, you know, he had over a hundred catches in his career at a time where you didn't throw the football. In the in the nineteen forties, and you got to think he also did this when Charlie Justice's career was going on. Now Charlie Justice is interesting, and we'll talk about him more in depth as to what you kind of consider him. But I mean, all, I, I think I think Art needs to be recognized here. Two time All American. Um, you know, I think it's kind of hard to like when I was doing the position groups. It's kind of hard with those guys because they played both sides of the football. During that time, you kind of had no choice. You had to play both sides of the football because there just simply weren't enough guys that wanted to play football, and you were that talented to where you know it, it was a different game as well. They were not running ninety plays a game. They were running twenty to thirty plays a game. So it made sense why you were playing both sides of the football. But I think, you know, his receiving numbers to be, I mean, there were, trust me, there were guys that had good receiving numbers. There were guys that reached the 1,000-yard the, the, the mark. To almost reach the 2,000-yard mark and have over 100 catches and 18 career touchdowns during that era is just ridiculous. But when you look at where he stacks up with the rest of these guys, including his teammate, Charlie Justice, who I think... I think that might be the biggest thing is that he we don't consider him to even be on the level of Charlie. How is he going to be in that group that we're discussing and saying, okay, these are the ones that should be hotly debated? I think he's worth talking about, but I don't think that he is in that hotly debated group. Yeah, no, definitely worthy of our, our time to talk about, and that's why we're doing it. Uh, you do what he did in the late 40s. Mm-hmm. Hell, you put him in the 70s, what those numbers look like. Oh, man. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. Now you put him in the modern era. <laughs> Hell, people do what he did in his career in seasons right now. Right. Depending on the kind of system you're in. But so what he did over the career, and like you said, wasn't even the first option on his team because you had Charlie Justice in your backfield. Right. Um, and he still was that productive. Mm. Okay, you're a great player. Yeah, no. Um so okay, so let's go into Charlie Justice because Charlie is very interesting. Now Charlie kind of played two different positions. He was a quarterback, believe it or not, for the Tar Heels at the time. But of course, as we know, during that time, everybody ran the same style of offense. It was a wing T or some variation of it. There, there. That was just that was what you ran. So when you look at Charlie's career. I think it's a little bit different because, look, the, the 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 running stats are not quite as gaudy as some of the other guys that we talked about. I mean, we're, you, we, we were talking about, um, you know, the group of running backs with Amos Lawrence who ran for almost 5,000 yards in his career. We talked about Don McCauley. We talked about a lot of those other guys. But when you look at, at Charlie and, and what he did, I mean, here's the thing. First of all, you got to be pretty pretty good. If you got a statue up of you outside the football stadium, um, you know there is no other Torio player that has a statue up of them. He's the only one. So, um, I mean, the thing is, is look when you when you're a guy that finishes second in Heisman voting in back to back years at North Carolina, which. Okay, at that time, you could make the argument was a football school. Within the very near future, they became a basketball school. And we have not seen anybody rival him since then when it's come to Heisman votes. Not even close. So, I mean, Charlie, he's, he's got to be he's got to be in consideration on this list. Yeah, okay. Let's just, you mentioned the, the Heisman runner-up twice. Right. He racked up 4,883 career yards, and that record stood in course until 94. The record for Carolina football while he was on the team, 32-7-2. Exactly. Some of the best four-year marks in the history of the program. They appeared in two Sugar Bowls. They haven't been to the Sugar Bowl since. 
Um, they got a number one national ranking while he was on the football team. That, Only time in school history yep. that that has happened. Um, was responsible for 64 touchdowns. So you do that over the course of his career, that's 16 touchdowns a year. The guy just dominated at a, at a place that right. was a football school but wasn't Alabama, Tennessee, Oklahoma – it was just football was more money at the time because basketball hadn't become the fixture it became on Ch- in Chapel Hill just yet. And so what he did and the fact that the team was winning makes it all the more better. Because we've had guys that are great players that produce, but we didn't necessarily win a lot. Right. But we were winning nationally. The closest we ever came to winning a national championship, in all honesty, and is probably those two years because you got the number one ranking yes. and you played in Sugar Bowl games. Right. I mean, Mac Brown never played in in a game like that that could determine a national championship. So he came. He came. He came close, he came close but Florida State was always the the, the thorn right. in the side. I agree with that. And that's when you when you look back. I want I want people if you can if you can find a day where you can get in. When I was up in Chapel Hill the last time, I went and did the football museum. Which was the first time that I could do it because I really hadn't been up there outside of game days because, well, let's be real honest, you know, I mean, if you go up there when it's not a game day, especially in the summer when it's usually going to be open, it's pretty quiet on campus. So it's not quite as exciting as, as it would be. We've been up there for some basketball events, but we didn't feel like it was right to go in and do the football museum. But I went in and did the football museum, and I'm going to tell you, the amount of stuff that they have on those uh, on those 48 and 49 teams is remarkable. These, I mean, there, there's a reason why, in my mind, Carl Snavely is a Tier 2 coach. Like, nobody talks about him. When you talk about the top coaches in Carolina history, Mac Brown, Dick Crum, who I got a, just an um, unbelievable amount of heat for putting him in my first tier. But I think, I mean, you look at most most career wins amongst the coach. That'll change, of course, with Mac Brown coming back. Um, you look at his record in bowl games. Really just, I mean, phenomenal coach who was there in the 80s. And then Bill Dooley. Nobody talks about Carl Snavely, who was just amazing. I mean, look at the, the amount of guys. You'd look at other guys like Irv Holdash, who was, who was a guy that was an All-American as well. A lot of phenomenal players on that team. But Charlie was just different. The, the one stat, when I look at it, that stuck out to me was that 4,883 yards. At the time, that was unheard of because he did play quarterback. So those total yards, you know, it's, it, how do you compare that with a guy like Leon Johnson who had almost 5,000 yards but did that all with either running the football or catching the football? It's weird. But the thing is, is that that mark stood until... Leon Johnson got on campus for total yards, period, right. amongst any player. That is crazy. Now, of course, quarterbacks in the modern era have broken that. Marquise Williams absolutely smashed that record. But for me, it's, it's – I mean, Charlie is just – he was the first great player in Carolina history. He was the first guy that you said, okay, this is the guy that's putting us on a national stage. And so – there's a reason that he's being considered here. And, I mean, you look at some of the other stuff. Like, during this time, he was kind of a do-everything guy. 64 career touchdowns. He also punted the ball, averaged forty-three yard, nearly 43 yards a punt, and was also a punt returner who averaged 14.2 yards per punt return, which is, that that's a great number. That's phenomenal. Now, at the time, okay, we don't know you know, what those numbers quite looked like, because I'm going to be honest, I haven't researched many other 1940s players to see if that's a great number. But in today's modern era, if you average like nine yards per punt return, you're, you're, you're pretty good. Like, I, I'm, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I'm willing to bet that Ryan Switzer's career punt return yardage average isn't even 14.2. That's pretty high. So Charlie was, was a special player, for sure. So I guess now... We move on to the two guys that probably come to mind first when you think about great players. Now, it was, it's interesting because you could argue both of them played the same position. Um, 
if you want to do it in modern terms, we've sort of gotten towards the era where they stack it up as pass rushers. That's what they consider your three, four outside linebackers, which is what LT was, and your defensive ends, usually four, three defensive ends, which is what Julius Peppers was. So I know for you it's got to be kind of hard to admit that Lawrence Taylor was a phenomenal player at both the college level. College level is not the problem. The NFL level, as a Dallas Cowboy fan, is what has to be a little bit of an issue. There's no problem admitting that because I'm not. Um, You're not a Washington fan, so. You well, <laughs> I'm, I'm. I'm not. I'm not that naive. Yeah. He was right. a special player um, that happened to play at, at the school that I love and support, and it just translated to the NFL where you got coached by two really good defensive-minded coaches, and Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick. Right. Um. And he was the first of his breed that was listed as a linebacker but didn't do traditional linebacker things. He wasn't there to play the run or, 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 or he was there to rush the quarterback. He didn't necessarily was, wasn't was a run fit guy or a pass fit guy. He was there to sack the quarterback. And he did that okay. at a really good level. Joe Theismann learned that the really hard way. So there's no it's not hard in admitting that. Right. He was a really good player, and he was a really good player at Carolina. Oh, yeah, on a team that the last time we won the ACC, he was on the team. Was, was one of the, he was one of the main reasons, if not the main reason. Um, was also a, a, a reason why this team had gotten close again to being nationally prominent again, was mainly right. because of Lawrence Taylor. Right. So I'm not going to sit here and discredit what he did in the NFL because oh, yeah, you know, what not. he did for my team in college, which made us nationally prominent. Well, again. at least you have the clear mind. Yeah. By the way, I think Emmett Smith is a very fine running back. We've had the discussion that I think Barry Sanders is a better and overall running back, but that's, that's a different podcast. But what I find interesting is you said that he was a pure pass rusher. When you look at his 1979 season at Carolina, I'll just read you off the stat line. 95 total tackles, 7 forced fumbles, 11 tackles for loss, 5 sacks, and an interception. So, in the NFL, yes. Yes. He was a pure pass rusher. It's interesting that he was able to play what seemed like more of a traditional linebacker role in that 1979 season for Carolina. To me... That tells me one thing. He is that good that he can play a position that if you just look at his NFL tape, you would say there's no way this dude could play could play a run stopping linebacker. Oh yeah, no, he he could have done both. Right. I think what happened in the NFL was Bill Parcells just noticed You were so good at the one thing, yeah. just go for it. Um, just keep doing it. I'm gonna make your it. yeah. We're we're gonna make your life simpler. Right. Because we can all admit LT wasn't the brightest guy in the classroom in the film session. Well, here's here's what you're gonna do: line up here and go hurt that guy. Well, and, and that's never the worst mindset and, and, to and, have. And there's nothing guys. wrong with that right. when it works and right. it helped it helped the Giants win two Super Bowls. Exactly, it got him in the Hall of Fame. Definitely. So there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But he was, like you said, he was a versatile enough player to where if he would have went somewhere else, and they were like, "Well, no, you're gonna be a traditional linebacker," he could have been a linebacker. Right. Oh, and I agree. Did, and, I and agree with just, that. And maybe not as not the same type of player, but it would have had a fine NFL career and would have helped that team win football games. So we talked about that 1980 season, and this is where LT became LT. 69 total tackles that season. Nice. <laughs> Three uh, forced fumbles. Seven fumble, or excuse me. Three fumble recoveries. My bad on that. 22 tackles for loss. Which, by the way, resulted in 149 yards of lo- lost for opposing offenses. And 16 sacks in one season. Which still stands as the Carolina record. Right. Craziness. 22 tackles for loss in a season is, is nuts in and of itself. But we had mentioned William Fuller earlier in a season. He or earlier in his career actually had that his sophomore season, which actually be 1981. So the next season, how about that? Back to back seasons during the 1980s, the Tar Heels had one player with at least 
22 tackles for loss. That's unheard of. Think of what we're at now where, you know, last season that we, we saw some hope in some of the guys that we had out there. But for LT, 16 sacks in a season is amazing. And there's a reason why he was named a unanimous first-team All-American in that 1980 season. One of just three Tar Heels to earn that distinct achievement. So, I think you're right. And the thing with LT is, like, when we talk about him, we have to consider his NFL career at least slightly, right? Like, it's just, it's so hard to ignore with him because he was such a great player at the NFL. Yeah, no, we're, we, we'd we be doing it a disservice if we didn't acknowledge what he did at the NFL level. He's known more as an NFL guy than he as a college guy, if we're being brutally honest, because played in played in New York, he won two Super Bowls, um, and was the fixture of that of the franchise during his time there. But for us that do some homework and you do some digging, he was a wildly productive player in college as well. Right. That helped a mediocre football program rise to national prominence and win a conference championship. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the time, you know, let, let's not act like this was a guy that took a program that was the you know bottom of the barrel. That's why they were, mediocre was the right. They were exactly. They were middle of the pack. Maybe you could get to seven wins a season, but this was what elevated them back to what we saw in the nineteen. 19- in the, in the late 1940s. Right. Into being that national contender. I mean, you talked earlier about a guy, you know, how much does a defensive guy actually mean to helping you win games? LT was a guy that, if you look back on it, you could make the argument that he was the reason that that 1980 team won certain games. And that's kind of what you look for when you talk about defensive players. But we got to transition from him to the more modern guy here that a lot of people want to discuss, which is Julius Peppers. Now, of course, I think with Julius Peppers, like it's 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 really hard in this region of the country to argue against Julius Peppers because so many people are just so connected with Julius and, and his story. Of course, you know, playing for the Carolina Panthers. Phenomenal NFL career where he had 195, or excuse me, 159.5 uh, sacks. Th- this was a guy that I mean, look, we you know, he was a he was a freakish athlete. This dude played not only for the football program, he was also a major part of Bill Guthridge's teams for the basketball program. So, I mean, when you talk about athletic, we just talked about how athletic Lawrence Taylor was. I mean, Julius Peppers is a defensive coordinator's dream to have out there with the amount of athleticism that he had. I mean, can you imagine him and Jay Bateman's offense? We've been talking so much about athletic guys, Julius Peppers would be a perfect fit. He was the first modern athletic defensive end that now is that transit to that position. He's the guy that did that. And it's kind of cool that it, it happened at Carolina. Um, you and I got to see him in Charlotte for roughly a decade, be a productive player. Mm-hmm. Um, and you talk about the athleticism. We had the luxury of having Matt Doherty on our basketball podcast that you and I do. And while we didn't get to talk to Matt Doherty about this topic, in an interview that Matt Doherty did with Jones Angel and Adam Lucas, was asked about Julius Peppers. Mm-hmm. And he basically said Peppers was good enough to make it in the NBA. So you're talking about a guy that was good enough to have an NFL career. He'll be a first ballot Hall of Famer in five years, and now that he's finally retired. Definitely, no question. But was also good enough to where if he would have chosen basketball, would have made it into the NBA. Oh, I agree with that. So you just talk about just pure talent. It's probably the most purely gifted player that's ever walked inside Keenan Stadium. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, you you look back. I mean, it started as a freshman where he was a first-team 
All American as a fre- first team freshman All American, I should say. Not first team All American, but a first team freshman All American and finished sixth in the ACC with six sacks. Then you might be saying, well, how, how great is that? Well, his sophomore season is where everything took off. He led the nation with 15 sacks that season, which again comes close to LT, but doesn't quite surpass LT's 1980 season. And finished third in the country, which I just find absolutely ridiculous. If you got, I mean, you got to go back and look at that 2000 season and just see what these defensive ends or linebackers were on with 24 tackles for loss. And that was third in the country. (laughs) And of course, went on, as many would expect, to earn first-team All-American honors. And in his final season, believe it or not, his numbers dropped off. But he was recognized once again as he had 19 tackles for loss and nine and a half sacks, which were actually enough to earn him not one, not two, but three defensive awards. He earned the Chuck Benderick, the Lombardi, and the Bill Willis Award and was named a unanimous first-team All-American. And when you compare the statistics between him and LT, it's crazy. I mean, his his 30-and-a-half sacks, second in school history, and then we talked about Will, William Fuller with 57 tackles for loss. That was the most in school history at the time. He finished with 53 in three seasons. So, I mean, th- this was just an otherworldly guy. I mean, you know, not only was he a fantastic pass rusher, I didn't write it down, but his interception number at Carolina was somewhere around like six or seven interceptions in three years. In the NFL, he had 11 as a defensive lineman. I mean, that is just, that is just ridiculous. Yeah, he had, he had five. Five Five interceptions interceptions. in his career at Carolina. Um, You just don't see that with defensive linemen. Yeah, some some other numbers that you may have listed that you maybe I, I I didn't hear. Uh, five forced fumbles, forty two hurries at the of the quarterback, right, and three defensive touchdowns. So this guy also scored. He, I'm, I'm telling you, man, he was just he was he was special. I mean, there was there's no there, there's no other way to put it. And to look back as Carolina fans, like, look, we're having this discussion because it's a special ed- edition of the podcast. To look back and actually be able to say. We have two of the greatest linemen in college football history and NFL history. Is just is just nuts. Well, they're they're the original part of why we you know we claim to be defensive line university. Right. That heritage starts with Lawrence Taylor. Right. Um, it was bred before Julius Peppers got there with some of those Mac Brown teams, but then Julius Peppers individually just right was doing stuff that you usually do as a whole unit. He did it. By himself. He was just that damn good. Okay. So, so here's here's what we're going to do. Let's rank these guys that we talked about. For you, from 3-1, to one, I'll rank mine from 4-1 to one, since I'm putting Dre Blanc. So I got to go first? Yes. I'm putting the pressure on. Um, so three, I go Lawrence Taylor. Okay. Okay. Um, two... I go Charlie Justice. Look at the production and the winning. Okay. And then one for me is Julius Peppers. Okay. He's the most gifted player that's ever put on the uniform. The production and what he did in three years is remarkable. Um, and I, I still can't over the fact that he, he was good enough to play football and basketball at, 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 at the pro level. An absolute freak, yeah. indeed. Okay. So I'm going to go four. Charlie Justice. Like the winning, I think you got to take NFL careers into account here just because of how close these guys are. So I think Charlie's in fourth. Third. See, this is tough. This is tough. I'm going to go LT in third. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I love all the production. The thing was, and this is, is actually a quote from Dick Crum, he was a guy that actually had to get on LT before his senior season because he knew he could do more than what he had shown in his Tar Heel career. So you wonder how gaudy those numbers could have been if he would have not been the late bloomer that he was. But still, fantastic. These decisions are ridiculously tough. I went Dre Bly number two just because, I mean, look, 
you you were a first team All American in three straight seasons, twenty career interceptions, one of the records that we think is nearly unbreakable, and is a guy that we have not seen anyone that's been comparable to a corner since then, where LT has Julius Peppers. And then number one, I'll go with Julius Peppers. Um, just the, the, the all-around ability of him, a guy that, you know, from the word go, was immediately one of college football's best, and did it back-to-back seasons where he was legit, Legitly, one of the best pass rushers in the country. So ultimately, we agree, but that's how this usually turns out on this podcast. But a fun little adventure there for you. So we want to mention one thing before we hit the 40 yard dash. The Heel Tough blog, of course, you guys know, is hosting a pregame show before the kickoff game against South Carolina. It will be held at Moo and Brew Restaurant here in Charlotte, 1300 Central Avenue. Um, just down the block from the stadium, about 10 minutes away. So uh, we encourage you guys to come out and hang out with us. We will talk about the game against South Carolina, break it down. We'll give you our official prediction for the game, as well as our official record predictions for the 2019 season out there. We're going to wait and hold off and give you guys all that stuff out there so we give you some extra incentive to tune in. If that isn't enough for you, we do have some special guests that are stopping by. You knew Ryan Houston. We had talked about him being on. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, but now we've got two other former Tar Heels who are going to be with us. Former wide receiver Nah Brown will join us, as well as former cornerback Errol Hood. So we hope you guys can come out, eat some good food, get your Charlotte version of the Blue Cup. Moo and Brew has their version, so come out and get that. And mainly just come out and talk a little Tar Heel football with us. We're going to have a ton of fun before the Tar Heels kick off against the Gamecocks. So that will bring us to the 40-yard dash. And on this edition of the 40-yard dash, we start by taking a look at some of the fall camp takeaways. Trey Morrison is experimenting out corner. There is some rumors that the nickelback will either be DeAndre Hollins or, as Taylor Vipple has said yesterday, possibly Cameron Kelly if he is cleared by the NCAA. We are still waiting on a decision as to whether or not he will be cleared. It is cutting pretty close to the season, so you would imagine that Mack Brown and his staff are not too happy about it, but hopefully that situation will be resolved soon. The defensive line is building good depth behind its starters. Zach Gill, Jaleel Taylor are some of the names that have really stepped up, according to Mack Brown and his staff, as well as Brant Lawless. So keep an eye on the defensive line to be a stronger unit even than it was a year ago. And in no shocking manner, the quarterbacks remain extremely close. We've seen some videos of the guys Jace Ruder has looked fantastic. Sam Howell has looked fantastic. Kate Fortin has looked fantastic. Plain and simple, this battle is definitely going to go down until the final week. Who knows? They could even rotate two quarterbacks in the first game of the season, something Torrio fans never really want to hear. But Mac Brown's track record of rotating two quarterbacks is a little bit better than Larry Fedora's. And the final tidbit that we have for you guys on... Uh, August 23rd, 2024, star safety Jaquaris Conley will announce his commitment. Of course, he plays at Northside Jacksonville High School in Jacksonville, North Carolina. The game was originally scheduled to be played at EA Laney High School, but did have to be moved to Northside High School. And when it was moved, that was when Conley said that he would make his decision. So that will take place right after the first game of the season. Keep it tuned to HeelToughBlog.com for all the latest updates. That's where you can check out the podcast as well as Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn or the TuneIn app. So I want to thank Josh for joining us. Thank you to all the listeners who have listened to this edition of the podcast and the 99 editions before it. Happy 100th edition of the podcast. And remember, as always, go Tar Heels!